Broadcasting from the Hair Salon corporate offices, it's the Suzanne Venker Show, where men and women are equal in value, but wildly different by nature. Drop the junk you've been fed from the culture and join us here every week as we help you and the people you love feel secure in your beliefs about what you know is right and confident in your desire to speak your mind. You might think getting marriage advice from a divorce lawyer sounds odd. In fact, it makes all the sense in the world. After all, divorce lawyers are not that different from marriage counselors with respect to what they see in their offices. It's true that divorce lawyers help couples get divorced rather than to stay together, but they nevertheless have a unique window into the lives of countless marriages. My guest today is divorce attorney Douglas Gardner, author of Amazing Intentions, the divorce attorney who wants to save your marriage. Douglas has handled thousands of divorce cases and has seen firsthand the patterns and problems that lead to the demise of marriages. What he has learned is that the main reason marriages fail is a lack of communication regarding expectations, as well as the inability to see issues through one's spouse's view of the world. Douglas lives in Arizona and was recently voted Arizona's number one divorce and family law attorney. He has been married for 24 years and has five children. Welcome to the show, Douglas. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming. I'm, I'm so excited to talk to you. I've been wanting to do this for a while because this angle to me is so it's unique, and yet it makes all the sense in the world, and I don't know why we don't hear more from divorce attorneys, but you might have a thought on that. <laughs> so I'm going to um, begin by asking you why you call yourself a recovering divorce attorney. Sure. I, I make my living doing divorce. I enjoy doing divorce. Uh, uh, but, but sometimes, uh, you know, I mean, I, I, I believe in marriage, and I believe that uh, people will be happier if they can figure out how to make their marriage work. Uh, as a necessity, some people need a divorce attorney, but uh, you know, I just, I, I guess, in doing it over many years, I just felt like I, I was taking away enough. I needed to put something back in, and so I've, I've really enjoyed uh, working with uh, writing this book and some of the other blog stuff I'm working on to uh, try and help some people. Uh, are, there are many marriages that do come in to get a divorce uh, that probably, with a little effort and in the right direction, could have avoided the divorce. So. Uh, you know, I'm still going to make plenty of money being a divorce attorney. That's still my primary career. Mm -hmm. uh, but if I can help save a couple marriages also, uh, I'm, I'm going to sleep better at night. So that's a really good question. Can you kind of guesstimate what percentages of – what is the percentage of people you've seen over the years who you think could stay married if they just, you know, weren't so – stuck on getting divorced. I guess that's the only way to put it. it yeah, it, it's hard to quantify, but probably, I don't know, 50 to 80 percent of the people that come in for divorce, probably if they uh, could have done things different. I mean, there, there are some marriages where the people are just completely different or, uh, you know, that, that that marriage was just doomed from the start. But yeah. I, I do a lot of prenuptial agreements, and, and it's interesting that I have not yet done a prenuptial agreement for a couple that felt like they were of in the 50% that would likely get a divorce. Everybody feels like they're in the 50% that will stay married. And so everybody's optimistic when they're getting married. Uh, but then during marriage, something happens over time. And so, uh, you know, I, I guess if we could get in our time machine and go back far enough, early enough in the marriage, I think a, a higher percentage of those marriages could be saved. Uh, of those people, by the time they come into my office, most of the time, it probably is too late. They've, they've, uh, you checked know, out. It, it, someone's checked out. Or, somebody's yeah. checked out. Yeah. They're neither side's willing to put what it takes in at that point, and and it has the uh, the marriage has circled the toilet and gone down far enough that it may be too hard to rescue at that point. Uh, but had they had a more appropriate counseling uh, mm -hmm. or coaching or or training earlier in the marriage, had they learned to see things from the other person's perspective earlier in the marriage, uh, they wouldn't even be in my office in the first place, yeah, I think. Yeah, great. And we're going to get into all that, plus some of those other projects I know you're working on. I'll ask you about that at the end. So I want to begin by having you explain the chocolate cake theory. You have a picture of a slice of chocolate cake on your book, Amazing Attentions. Again, that's the name of it. If anyone wants to look it up, you can see that lovely picture and make you hungry. So tell us about that. Sure. The chocolate cake, number one, it, it, it makes good cover art for, for selling books, so that's why we have it there. But the chocolate cake theory uh, is really, I, I noticed this as a, as a parent. I had my three older boys are all real close in age to each other. Uh, and when I would bring out a piece of cake or, or uh, you know, any treat and have one of my boys cut it and say, hey, cut this into three pieces, make sure everybody gets a piece. Uh, whichever boy was tasked with cutting would make sure they got the biggest piece. The other two boys would get crumbs. What I learned over time is instead of asking them to cut it and make sure everybody got a piece is I would say, look, 
number boy number one, you're going to cut this, and then boy number two and boy number three, they're each going to pick their piece, and then whatever's left, that's the piece that you get. Now, my boys struggled with math, but when we did this task, they became geometric geniuses in that they could cut that piece of cake in exact thirds so that whatever piece was left over last, they were going to make sure it was as big as everybody else's. What we see with this, I mean, this, this story, I've, I've used it so many times even for, uh, you know, in closing arguments and other things for judges. But what, what the story tells us is that when, when we're cutting the piece and we're also picking first, in our mind, there's going to be reasons why we deserve the biggest piece. We deserve the biggest piece because we're the oldest. We deserve the biggest piece because we had a tough day at work. We deserve the biggest piece because, anyway, I'm sure we can come up with some reason why we think we deserve the biggest piece. But our other two siblings or our spouse may not agree with those reasons. And so when we're forced to know that we're going to get the last piece, whatever that is, all of a sudden we're forced to see the world from the perspective of the other two brothers or from our spouse. And so as we then start looking at that and saying, okay, what are they going to see? How are they going to see it? We, are, we have a much better opportunity. So, you know, when I just had one boy cut the cake and make sure everybody got a crumb or whatever, there was going to be fighting between the boys. When I had one boy cut it and the other two boys both got to pick first, mm. there wasn't the fighting because everybody knew going in what to expect and everybody was really looking out for the, the look, looking at it from the other person's perspective. Yeah, that's really good. So that was your sort of analogy to the idea of great actions versus great intentions, right? Correct. Yeah. So yeah, it's not enough just to have a, a, a great intentions of making sure everybody's happy, but but really making sure it is cut equally so that everybody is, you know, everybody wants to feel like they've been treated equally. That's good. So that's that's one of the sort of takeaways, I guess, that you had over the years of working with couples and realizing that so many of them are not doing this, I guess. Is that Accurate. Well, yeah. In, in divorce, it's amazing that, that what I see is that, uh, you know, there's, uh, you know, nearly every person who comes in and hires me says, Mr. Gardner, I just want what's fair. And then they expect that their divorce is going to be easy. And I have no doubt that their spouse is in telling their attorney, I just want what's <laughs> fair. The problem is wife wants what's fair in the divorce to her and husband wants what's fair in the divorce for him. And sometimes what each of them view as fair is so amazingly different that no wonder they're in our offices yeah. getting a divorce. I've even had judges uh, sometimes jokingly say to the both attorneys, you know, are you sure your spouse, your, your, are you sure your clients were married to each other? Because I hear his story and it's so completely different mm. than her story. You know, are, could these people, could, could they even been married to each other? Amazing. Amazing. Scary, I guess, in a way. I mean, it's almost like, yeah. So I'm going to shift gears now, and I want to talk about a very big piece of marriage and something I've written about a lot, and that is the idea of expectations. And I know that you cover that uh, big time in the book. So let's talk about w why I think we both agree that having certain expectations, well, I think you might come, come at it a little bit differently. I've always argued that the, the fewer expectations you have, the better, because either you're going to have those met or you're going to be surprised, pleasantly surprised, and then you're not disappointed. But you're also making the point that communicating one's expectations is also key. You want to talk about that? Sure. Hey, we see often that, the, I mean, generally, if anybody is frustrated, it's because they've had expectations and those expectations weren't met. I mean, look at everything. Everybody's frustrated right now being stuck in their homes with COVID-19. Nobody expected to be stuck in their home. And so that's creating the frustration. Uh, you know, in, in any argument, you have an argument with your boss, you have an argument with your kids, you have an argument with your spouse. It's because somebody had an expectation and then that expectation wasn't met. And that's the cause of the consternation between them. And so... Uh, you know, I, I like your approach of just <laughs> get rid of the expectations in the first place. That that might help, but you know, there, there, you know, we do have I mean, to basic have some ones. I'm not, I'm not that bad. I mean, I get the basic also. ones, but I just meant over and beyond and above. <laughs> Go ahead. Sure. Oh, having yeah. having yeah. too many expectations absolutely can can make a divorce miserable, can make a marriage miserable. But if you do have expectations, what I see is so often that that one spouse has these expectations. But the other spouse doesn't even know about them. And, and so when those expectations are not met, surprise, surprise, they weren't met. But the other spouse didn't even know that they were supposed to be competing in that arena. And so by, by having expectations, by communicating those expectations, the other person then has an opportunity to, to try and meet those. And so I, a lot of times I joke about that 
you know, a, a good marriage, a good relationship requires the ability to see things from the, to read the other person's mind. And so the best thing I can do to help my spouse read my mind is tell her what's on my mind. And the best thing she can do to help me read her mind is to tell me what's on her mind, to tell me her expectations. So simply having expectations, they're going to be unmet if the other person doesn't, if we don't properly communicate those to the other side so that they have an opportunity to rise to the occasion and, and meet those expectations or to help us manage our expectations and explain why those are not realistic expectations. Yeah, and this really becomes place. an issue when we're dealing with male and female brains and how differently they communicate, how differently men and women communicate with one another. Uh, men are more likely to be more succinct, for example, when they do want, when they, if they are going to convey their expectation, although very often they don't convey them at all. And then women um, want sort of a man to read her mind, which of course he can't do. And they're very uncomfortable with just telling them flat out, this is what I want. So they harbor these ideas, expect him to know. And then when he doesn't get all upset. And so that's one of the things that I work with, with couples is no, 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 you have to just lay it on the table and it's the way you do it that matters. It's all about the delivery and the tone, right? So you can do that in a way that a man will hear that. And a man can do it in a way that a woman will hear that. But you have to understand how the opposite sex thinks and receives information in order to do that well. I, I would agree with that. And, and I'll probably get in trouble for telling the story, but it, it took me three or four years to understand that when my wife uh, wanted a hug, when she was frustrated, she would express <laughs> her frustration, not ask for a hug. And, and to, to me as a guy, when she was expressing her frustration, uh, you know, I saw a cactus and the last thing I wanted to do was go hug that cactus. And what she was saying is, you know, I'm frustrated. Of course I need a hug. And what I was saying is, oh, let yeah. me out of this room. Let me out of this house. Yeah. I want to be as far away from this cactus as I can. And it, it took a lot of conversations for me to realize that if I would go hug the cactus, oh. the, the, the spines would, would melt as I'm hugging it. And, and it, that was tough. That was tough for me as a guy. To, I'm so glad you said accept. that. Yeah, First I mean, of all, same, same here. Absolutely same. Um, I And it's funny that you said that because I just had someone on recently who we were talking about um, men um, uh, understand. Well, one of the things we were talking about is understanding how to deal with a woman's sort of erratic emotions when she's not conveying anything specifically in the way that a man would want to hear it. She's just, excuse me, she's just acting emotional about it. And you don't know what that means, which is basically what you just described, the best thing you can do is to walk over there and soften her by simply giving her a hug, right? Even when she's in the mode that you don't, right. like you just said, want to be anywhere near her. So that's interesting that you brought up that example. I love it. It's hard to do. And I've, it, and I've learned that, but it, yeah. it is, it is it so is, hard but, to but actually do. Could you explain <laughs> what happens when you do force yourself to? Tell other men so they get it. <laughs> well, no, I, yeah, usually absolutely. ends in a good I mean, result. That's absolutely. really ultimately what a woman's crying out for when she's acting, you know, emotional. So, um, or I shouldn't say acting, being more emotional and less verbal. Okay. Um, so speaking of sex differences, since we're on the subject, um, you have said that you, regarding sex specifically, that you're amazed at the number of female clients and you, you, couched this with talking about the men too. So we're going to get to that as well. I'm amazed at the number of female clients who have cut off their husbands sexually for months or years and are then surprised that he cheated or asked for a divorce, which I find shocking. And I just can't get my brain around it, even though I know it happens because to me, it's just a logical follow for the, for the, for what has come before. What has been your experience with this? Well, I, I have seen this. I mean, there's a couple things that always surprise me. In that one, I've got to tell a quick side joke, and I'll come back to your point. But uh, one of my favorites is is when I say, okay, well, why are you getting a divorce? Or why, why did your wife file for divorce? Or why did your husband file for divorce? Oh, I don't know. I have no idea. All right, well, let me get some basic information. What, what's your date of marriage? I don't know. <laughs> you know, It's like, okay, so you've been married 10 years, and you don't know your anniversary date. Okay, let me let me guess why you're getting a divorce. But But right next to that one in humor – is those that, you know, the spouse says, you know, he had an affair on me. Uh, and, and then as we talk further, uh, you know, find out that they, they haven't even had sex for, for years and years and years uh, or months and months and months. Well, you know, guys' expectations are mm -hmm. much more simple than women's expectations. And, and mm -hmm. at the top is mm -hmm. they need food and sex. And food and, and sex. And food uh, and sex. <laughs> to, 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 feel, yeah. to feel like they're in, in yeah. charge a little bit. You know, that, that's, that's yeah. the top of guys' list. Those are easy. But how to keep women happy. I, you know, that's a much longer book and I'm certainly not ready to write that one yet. But 
so, but yeah, I've, I've always kind of chuckled at that. You know, I, we, you know, we haven't had sex for, for two or three years and, but I, you know, I can't believe he went out and had an affair on me. Well, you know, they're probably, if we could go back in time three years, I could probably help that yes. woman. Yes. Hello. Avoid yes. Call you know, me. Call me. Affair. But so <laughs> I'm going to ask you something about that. So that must be so hard to listen and then just not say anything because it's not technically your job to counsel. But what do you do in that boat? I'm curious. Uh, eventually I write a book on it. Yeah, I, I let it fester and eventually I write a book. Yeah, as, as a divorce yeah. attorney, I have to be very careful. I mean, I have very strict bounds, I have guidelines. I My job is really not to tell people, yes, you need a divorce. And, and if I get into counseling uh, and trying to help them with their marriage, I have a, I have a, an interest in helping them to save their marriage. That then gets in the way of me being the cutthroat, me, nasty divorce attorney that I need to be. So it is very important yeah. when, when people are my clients. Oh. I'm not trying to save their marriage. I'm trying to help them get the best outcome in their divorce. Uh, but but those kind of things just over the years, that's probably kind of why I started yeah. compiling my notes and writing this book is I just had to get this out to the world of, look, there's some very simple things you can do to avoid becoming my client. And okay, th so let's talk about those, for, those things. What is, so t sex is at the top of your list or specifically meeting each other's needs and then you're pointing out that men's are very simple so they're kind of easier to understand at least in terms of how to meet them and then there's the other side. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, as far as what what helps to avoid a, a, avoid a divorce, I mean, the simplest really is those of, of learning to uh, understand the expectations of the other spouse and then trying to trying to read their mind and learning how to see things from their perspective uh, it's it's as a marriage you've got to be working together and too often you know if, if if husband is out there trying to do everything that's best for him but but ignoring the spouse she's going to feel ignored her needs are not being met she's going they're going to become a client and vice versa so really it is learning to empathize learning to uh learning to try and Turn the tables. Figure out a way to 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 make sure that you're looking at what the other side needs. And, and yeah. there's so many iterations of this. When I was a when I was a younger divorce attorney, my first couple of years as a divorce attorney were very painful. Uh, I would go home often very insecure in my marriage. We had a good marriage. We had a strong marriage. We had young kids. We were happy. But uh, what I would see is I'd, I'd go to work and they'd say, you know, a wife would come in and say, I need a I need to file for a divorce because my husband never cleans up his socks. And then I'd go home and my wife would say, you know, hey, you could sure do, <laughs> do some, you know, clean up the house a little bit once oh in a while. And I, I would go into panic mode of, you know, is she planning to file for a divorce? I'm doing that. I'd, <laughs> I'd go to work and, and somebody would say, you know, my wife never spends enough time with the kids. And I'd go home and my wife would tell me that I, you know, hey, you should really spend more time with the kids. I'd go into panic mode. And it took a lot of conversations for, for her and I to both get comfortable with the fact that we did have a strong marriage. We both thought well, that, sure. but, but all of a sudden I had all these fears from people telling me why they were getting a divorce. And over time, I came to realize that people don't know why they're getting a divorce. People are getting a divorce because they're not happy and they don't know why they're not happy and they don't know why. Uh, and so, but, but all of these really came down to that one spouse was having an expectation that wasn't being communicated to the other spouse and or the, the, the other spouse was not seeing things from the other person's point of view. So if you can communicate, I, you know, I, I absolutely don't want socks on the floor and and oh, by the way, I'm, I'm not yeah. happy when you do X, Y, and Z. If you can do it nicely yeah. without nagging, and again, that's a whole other chapter, uh, then in your marriage, both of, both parties are going to have an ability to, to get along better. Now, are there some people that are so absolutely narcissistic that they're never going to be able to learn this and never yes. going to see things from another <laughs> point of view? Yes, there are. There are some marriages that you and I working our hardest, absolutely, even with a time machine, aren't going to be able to save. But most marriages, I think, uh, if we, if you and I can help them early enough in there, help them learn some skills. Well, I think and one of the keys to that today. of all of this that we're talking about is the idea, and I talked about this with a marriage counselor a couple of weeks ago. That, and she has this. It's funny because you're the divorce attorney. This was a marriage counselor, and you both have the same takeaway. That so many part. I mean, maybe the majority of partners, married partners, go in to either counseling or come into your office or whatever with the expectation. Well, no, this wouldn't apply to you specifically more to her, but with the expectation that the counselor is going to fix the other person as opposed to what you really need to be in there for, which is why my coaching, my coaching um, is very different because I work individually with the couples on themselves. That's, that's the biggest thing of, of my work because that's, that's literally what's going to transform your marriage is to get the blame off of the other person and to look inside at what's happening within you. And if you're constantly doing the opposite, you're never going to win. It's not going to work. 
Absolutely. I've seen that many times. And, and some of my referral sources are marriage counselors. I mean, people go to marriage counseling and the marriage counselors try for a little while and then and they become my client shortly thereafter. But what I see so often and even sometimes, you know, we're, we're, the divorce has been filed. We're partly through it. And, and one side says, you know, hey, let's let's put it on hold and go to counseling. I can tell which ones are going to be successful when my client says, yeah, we're going to go to counseling so that she can get the help she needs. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I know that that case is going to go forward. <laughs> and so or, or the other side is saying, you know, if, if, if he could just counsel, if he could just go to counseling, I, I'm sure this, this marriage will f work. No, I mean, you know, it went for marriage counseling to work. And I'm sure it's the same with coaching. Uh, <laughs> then, you know, both sides have to go in willing and able, willing and ready to try and fix themselves. Uh, and if the other person gets fixed along the way, that's fine. But but no, too often, it's a, it, again, it goes back. It's a failure to see things from the other person's perspective. When we're looking at it only from our perspective, the other person needs to be fixed. But if we could then see it from the other person's perspective and realize, well, there's some flaws in ourselves that we need to fix, that's going to open up their minds. That's going to open up their willingness to try new things and to, to try and make the changes that are necessary to have counseling or, or coaching or or any effort Did to fix their marriage read, work. Um, How to Win Friends and Influence People, Dale Carnegie's book. Yeah, I know. It's old. About 30 years ago, <laughs> old, but I yes, absolutely. It still does well because it's had uh, updated editions or whatever, but there's so much in there that is applicable to marriage, uh, which he does mention, although he focuses so much on sales in that book. Um, and, and Yeah, no, and, and, and being, being yeah. a good spouse, is, you, you've <laughs> right. got to be a salesman. <laughs> I mean, just the whole idea of how to get the other person to soften or how to get the other person to feel good about themselves. Basically, basically, it's a lesson there in how to read people and give of yourself and to be psychological in your approach to getting what you want as opposed to nagging or, in his case, doesn't talk so much about that, but being a bad boss, for example, like telling your telling – your, uh, uh, people beneath you what to do as opposed to being um, going about it in a different way to get the same result. I mean, excuse me, to get the result that you want. Um, just really interesting parallels. I don't know what made me think of that specifically that what, of what you said, but at any rate. Um, okay, so that leads into um, another attitude, I would call it an attitude, that people often bring to the table. And I think this is, I think this is a bigger issue with women than with men, um, is whether you want to be right or whether you want, to, you want to be married or as you put it, do you want to be right or do you want to be divorced? So explain this significant, the significance of this, uh, you know, question within. Yeah. Sure. No. And, and I, I see this often and, and yeah. each of those are a chapter in the book. Do you want to be right or do you yeah. want to be married or do you want to be right or do you want to be divorced? So the, let's go with, okay. do you want to be right or do you want to be married first? Uh, you know, there are going to be times in the marriage where both parties because they're not able to read each other's minds, in their own mind, they're right. And if you're right, you must assume that everybody else is wrong. And so and the, the whole problem with being right is then you have this moral ability to do whatever you want because you're right and everybody else can be crushed because they're wrong. And so when you have two people walking around thinking they're right, there's going to be a collision. And so when that collision happens, somebody has to give. And so, it, you know, to, in order to get somebody to give, the question has to be asked, you know, do you want to be right? If both sides absolutely want to be right at all costs, well, the price is the marriage. If both sides are willing to, to walk away. What I, you know, what I found, again, I, I always go back to personal experiences and hope my, my wife watching this doesn't get mad at me, but, but you know, a lot of our bigger arguments in our first couple of years of marriage is we were learning to adjust was, you know, there would be some little tiny incidents that one person would get mad at the other person and then the other person would get mad at the other person for being mad. And then the other person would get even mad at the other person for being mad at that. And, and all of a sudden, we just had this big, huge anger. Uh, and eventually, somebody had to apologize. I will tell you, the first couple of years, it was always me that had to apologize first. And I had to gr grit my teeth. And I was what I was really saying is, I'm sorry. And I think whatever, and that, that, that you made such a big deal out of this or whatever. But I would say, I'm sorry first. And then she'd apologize. And everything would kind of de-escalate. But, but none of our fights were right. Worth Right, right. The the substance of what we were fighting about was never worth even talking about. It was just we were more mad at how the other person overreacted in our mm -hmm. minds to whatever it was that we were fighting about. And so that insistence on being right, you know, somebody eventually had to back down and, and, and be willing to say, okay, it's it's our marriage is more important than being right. And now switching over, do you want to be right or do you want to be divorced? 
I still see this. And, you know, people are the same people in a divorce, except for they're their worst same people because they're going through the worst time of their lives. They're their nerves are frayed, their patience is shot, but they're the same people and their ability to get along or not is the same. And so often when we're negotiating divorce settlements, you know, we get to the end of a long, long day and we've, we've gotten everything covered and somebody wants one last thing. I, so many times I've seen the entire agreement blow up because that one last thing worth about $100 is all of a sudden more important to both parties than the, the thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars we've been negotiating all day. And, and all of a sudden, they just won't budge on that last thing. And I've used that line many times in helping people look where at the end of the day, you know, all they want is an extra hundred dollars to towards the child's college account. Well, I don't want to give it to her. Well, OK, you know, do you want to do you want to be right? right. Do, you, do you want to do you want to be right and say, OK, it's not worth it. She doesn't deserve this. And you can pay me ten thousand dollars <laughs> more to take your case to yeah. trial. Or yeah, exactly. do you want to be divorced next week and be done with this woman what do or they this choose? man and never have to talk to him what or her again choose? and never have to go forward? <laughs> what do they choose? So, Which one do they choose? I'm sorry. <laughs> you, well, I'm a, I'm a, I have read win how friends. to win, yeah. win people, uh, win friends and influence people. Oh, and so I'm usually a pretty good salesman. <laughs> so usually I can convince them that, you know what, uh, you do need to walk away from this one last thing. You do have to make this final concession. Uh, and then most of the time they do thank me the next day when they've calmed down and collected themselves and they're, you know, they're back to their senses. They're glad that they did give that last thing and, and get the divorce. But I have had occasion where, you know, a, a $400 vacuum is more important than tens of thousands of dollars it's going to cost to go to trial. You know, yeah. okay, fine. Oh, that's so how I make sad. my money. Oh my gosh. I could never do what you do just because I couldn't shut my mouth. <laughs> I mean, every time they would speak, I would have I would have something to say, and I couldn't say it. That would be very hard for me, Douglas. Oh my gosh! Okay, <laughs> it, it, maybe they'll read my book, and and again, my book has no real people. Oh, in let's it, no let's, let's examples, take a few but, minutes just to tell but, people what Amazing Attentions is, because when I first got it, I thought it was a straight up nonfiction book, and I had to ask you about that. So go ahead and yeah. Yeah. Sure. No, I, I remember getting your email saying, you know, hey, I looked at the cover and it looks like this is a fiction book. Right. You know, are you sure that <laughs> you want to be on my show? I, you know, I thought you were disinviting me. So I had to quickly say, no, no, it's it's, it's allegorical. It makes sense. Um, but yeah, the, the book is written is I, I started to write it as as here are my ideas with me talking and, and I bored myself and I just it, it just I wanted to make it a little more fun read. So I've, I've written it as a story of, of Wesley, a, a young kid that's getting engaged and his struggle and and uh, uh, anyway, but, but all of these to tie all these stories in, but really what it is, is, is just a, an ability for me to tell what I've learned over the years uh, as a divorce attorney and, and, and to help people. But there's no real examples. I mean, I've been very careful not to use actual clients and, and anything, but the characters are very real because they're a conglomerate of everybody. I mean, I've had 2000 or so uh, divorce cases. And in those 2000 cases, what I've learned is that most people behave yeah. somewhat similar in a divorce situation. And so these characters are yeah. very real characters. They're not representative of any real people, but they're very real characters going through a very real experience. Uh, and hopefully as people read that, they'll they'll be able to uh, to feel that, that and see that. And, yeah, I and think that can be extremely effective. I've had two other, just so you know, I, I have had two other authors on who had the same types of books. They told a story instead of a straight up nonfiction book. And yeah. it's very effective, very effective. Yeah, so I get it. Okay, you also talk about reading one's spouse's mind. And I think that's, you said specifically, when we try to read our spouse's minds, we need to give the benefit of the doubt rather than assume the worst. I think that's an important one. And this is, yeah, b both in divorce and marriage. Let's, I guess let's go with marriage first. There, we grow up watching TV and there's good guys and bad guys. And, uh, you know, my youngest daughter is three right now and she'll see somebody and, you know, dad, is, hmm. is that a good person or a bad person? <laughs> Yeah. Wow. You know, everybody in their own mind is a good person. That's the title of the book, Amazing Intention. I mean, Hitler had amazing intentions. We don't agree with those intentions, but in his mind, he had amazing intentions. A lot of people that do bad things had amazing intentions in their own mind. And so, but the, the principle of amazing intentions is that when people do things, we have to assume they did it for good reasons, especially, I mean, we do have to give the benefit of doubt to our spouse. So if our spouse does something that we don't like, we need to assume that they did something good for the right reasons, even Flubbed if they, it up or whatever, or, or yeah, even if right. we don't agree with what they did. The, the other the, as a quick example, the other day I, I had uh, went into the kitchen and my wife was feeling bad. I, I loaded up the dishwasher and got it all taken care of for her. And 
I, I forgot to hit start. And so the next day, there was a bunch of dirty dishes. She went to go do the dishes, and she opened up the dishwasher, and there was a bunch of dirty dishes, and it hadn't started. And at first, her initial reaction was she was mad at me for doing that. Now, when, when I pointed out my amazing intentions that I did, I never do the dishes around the house. That, the fact that I did the dishes, I should have got a star for that. I should have got a, a, a prize for that. But when I pointed out, look, I had amazing intentions. I did the dishes for you. The fact that I don't know what buttons to push at the end. Okay, you've got to give me a little bit of slack there. And we were able to laugh about that a little bit just because, yeah. you know, we needed to because she was stressed. And so when we assume that our, when our spouse does something we don't like, if we take a step back and say, okay, why did they do this? If, 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 our act, if our thought is always, they did this to get me, they did this to make me mad, really? You, you know, we married somebody that is going to intentionally go out and try and destroy our lives and destroy our marriage. Really, we were very wrong to have married that person. Well, that's maybe 1% of the cases. In 99% of the cases, we see <laughs> things different than they do. And, and when we can take a moment back, read their mind and say, why did they do this? There's usually a much better answer. Because they're an than, ass. Than I have, I'm to, laughing to because I cannot believe you used that example. I'm not kidding you when I say that has been the number one or one of the biggest. Um, it's, it's not an issue at all. That's not really the right word. But it's, it's an ongoing thing until a couple years ago when I finally accepted it. And I've been married 22 years. So that's how long it took me to accept it. Yeah. But, you're... you're your, your husband called me and told me to put, I mean, I to swear put that it feels in. like he did. That is absolutely what he does. He does the whole dish. He'll do the whole kitchen except for wiping down the counters in the end and turning the damn dishwasher on. And because it's so different from my personality, for years I'm like, I don't understand. I just want to understand. Seriously, like I wasn't even mad. I wanted to understand how you, you get to that point and you're at the end and then you say, okay, I guess I'm going to leave without... <laughs> Without finishing the job by just pressing start. So this this would go on for years until finally I just did this deep breath. And I said, I'm going to accept that the dishwasher will never, ever be turned on. And I'll be doing that for the rest of my life. But at least the dishes are in the dishwasher. And and that was that. <laughs> I've learned. Yeah, no, you've, you've learned. And to this day, I still don't get it. <laughs> but you know what? I never will. And that's okay. You just accept it and move on. I definitely have bigger fish to fry. Okay, so let's talk about some of the stories from the book. The Cotton Flower, Toothbrush, and Dirty Dishes. You wrote those down to make sure we discussed. So let's do that. When you got married, things were perfect. You were both in love and life was good. Then somewhere along the line, everything changed. She changed. Or maybe he did. Either which way, now your relationship feels, well, hard. I coach husbands and wives who feel lonely, disrespected, or misunderstood in their relationship. So many women today are desperate for their husbands to step up to the plate, to make a decision and to stick to it, to lead rather than to follow. Ladies, you have the power to make it happen. Men respond best to women who are grounded in their feminine core. As for husbands, so many of them want their wives to stop nagging and to just trust them, to smile more and to complain less, to look at them the way they did when they were first dating. Men, you have the power to make it happen. Women respond best to men who are grounded in their masculine core. The secret to lasting love rests in the masculine-feminine dance. Once you master it, your relationship will no longer be difficult. You'll be moving with the biological tide rather than against it. And that makes marriage smooth sailing. If you're struggling in your relationship, if you feel frustrated or alone, I can help. Just go to SuzanneVenker.com, that's S-U-Z-A-N-N-E-V-E-N-K-E-R.com, and click on the coaching button at the top. Don't wait another minute to acquire the mindset you need to find love and to sustain it. It's so much easier than you think. That's SuzanneVenker.com. Sure. Th these are fun stories, and, and this really happened to me. Uh, in, in the story, it's told from Wesley's perspective, but, but so... When I was getting married, I listened to every piece of advice I could get because I, I wanted to be successful. And I remember three specific because they this is you'll, you'll figure out why I remember these three specific pieces of advice. But my dad told me, you know, hey, women don't want to feel like they have to do all the housework. So, you know, once you get married after dinner, you know, offer to help do the dishes. Tell your wife you'll help her with the dishes. I thought, great, dad, I'll, I'll remember that. I had a, a, a clergy member, a bishop tell me, you know what, women like to be noticed and given special attention. So sometime, you know, do nice things, go buy a flower. And, you know, if you're poor and going through college, which we were, you know, you, you can go, you know, get a nice flower off from the side of the road or something, mm -hmm. give her something. Women like to be noticed for something. And then I had another uh, church member that was given a talk, a well-respected church member and given a talk. And he said, you know, try and find ways to serve your wife, do something nice. And he gave an example, you know, that when they got married, what he started doing is that when he'd brush his teeth, he would put some toothpaste on his toothbrush and then put toothpaste on his wife's toothbrush at the same time. 
And I, I just wrote these down and remembered. And, uh, you know, a couple of weeks later, we got married. Well, we got back from our honeymoon and I cooked dinner that first night. It was hamburger. I still remember it. And after cooking dinner, uh, I we had a nice meal. I looked over at my wife and said, you know, hey, can I help you with the dishes? And something happened and I wasn't quite sure. It wasn't what I expected. And as I watched her for a little bit, I, I could tell I've got nine sisters. I, I know what mad looks like. Nine so sisters. Said, Did you say yeah, nine sisters? Whole, whole nother story. <laughs> oh, my God. You have nine sisters. Yes. So, Do you have any brothers? Uh, there's there's six of us. So I have five brothers. There's six. There's six brothers, fifteen total. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I was gonna do the math, but then I didn't think the math would be right. But I guess it is. Okay, got it. So uh, as I as I offered to help her with the dishes, she she got mad and so I you know said, "Are you mad?" No, no, I'm not mad. I'm just thinking. And, and so, but I could tell she was mad, and that caused us a little bit of friction. We we're just newlyweds, and and we didn't need that friction, but we I couldn't quite figure out how to get past that. So. I went on to the next plan. The next day, we were living down in southern Arizona and, and beautiful cotton fields. And cotton has a very beautiful flower. And so I pulled off the side of the road and picked a couple of cotton flowers and brought it home and presented it to her, a bouquet of cotton flowers. And, and she looked at me really strange, like I just brought her a bunch of weeds or something. And, and uh, you know, I was trying to do something nice. So I went in that night. And, and uh, as I was brushing my teeth, I remembered the other bit of advice. And I put some toothpaste on, on her toothbrush. And kind of watched as she came into the bathroom. I watched her, and she looked at her toothbrush and looked at me a little bit. And but it just these were just causing stress. And it was there was a couple of days. I mean, we, I hadn't learned to communicate real well, and hadn't learned to open up. And uh, you know, I, all all three of these, I was trying to do the right thing. I was trying to do the nice thing, and all three of these just blew up right in my face. And so once it finally blew up, we had the conversation. And and from her perspective. Uh, when I had offered to help her with the dishes, in her mind, we were married. We didn't have kids. We both had jobs. Why were they her dishes that I was offering right. to help her? Okay, right. yeah, right. point made. Okay, I can kind of see that. But I was offering to help. I mean, I needed a little bit of credit. Uh, when I brought her some cotton flowers, I mean, I had put in some effort. But, you know, for, for $10, I could have bought a bouquet of really nice flowers. And we were poor, but you know, we probably could have done it. So she didn't appreciate the weeds as much as I thought she would. Uh, and then, you know, we were... Uh, young and, and just getting married and, and, and living together for the first time. And, and here I am putting toothpaste on her toothbrush, giving her you know body hygiene hints or something. She, she thought maybe I was <laughs> complaining that she had bad breath or, or, or something of that nature. And so, oh, you know, so these are, <laughs> oh these my are three perfectly good okay. stories of, of me having amazing intentions, trying to do something good, trying to express to her uh, you know, love yeah. through service or acts of kindness, right? And, oh and her God. not seeing it and seeing it in different ways. So, you know, we do that. Learning how to see things from the other person's perspective, and learning how to see the, and, and then from the flip side, her learning to appreciate my amazing intentions, even when right. she doesn't agree with my actions. I mean, these right. are just good examples of what it takes to make a marriage work. So now I understand with so many siblings why you were making that connection about growing up with many siblings, <laughs> um, with the parents never being able to pin anything on one person and what, how, how that affects your marriage down the road. What, what was your point there? Sure. The, the, the growing up with, with 15 kids, I mean, the, the, who did this? Nobody did it. I mean, that was an absolute way to get out of it. I mean, nobody could ever prove who did anything <laughs> with, with that many kids running around the house. So I, I learned to hide behind that. If, you know, if I didn't want to fess up to something, I just say, oh, I don't know who did it. Well, we got married and it was just the two of us in the house. And, you know, somebody <laughs> left the seat up after they peed in the, in the bathroom. And, and you know, I don't know, it wasn't me. It couldn't have possibly been me. And she looked at me square in the eyes and said, you know, it, it, it wasn't me. And they're going to the two of us here. <laughs> <laughs> That's not going to fly, you, Douglas. So yeah. let's, let's just stop lying. Anyway, that, that really was a breakthrough <laughs> for my mind of learning to read things from her perspective is that, that, that she, she could tell when I was lying. That's too funny. That's a good one. Okay, and two more. One, uh, the guacamole story. The guacamole, this one. As, as the two of us were bringing her family and her family's traditions in and my family and my family's traditions in, uh, you, you know, there's going to be some – uh, some some interchange and some fun. Well, in my family, uh, we grew up fighting over when 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 we got had avocados. We like to take the pit. You know, you pull it out; it still has a little bit of flesh on it. You put some salt on it. We just anyway, we, yeah. we fought over who got to suck on the pit and get the, the yeah. last little bit off. Well, apparently in her family, they use the pit as garnish on top of the guacamole, and so. 
I didn't know that one time. I, was <laughs> I know what's coming. Of, yeah, you're, you're already there. You're figuring it out. I've been put in charge of making the guacamole. I did it. I sucked on the pits. I set them off the side. I went to the bathroom and somebody set the table and I got back and there was the pits that I'd sucked on up on top of the guacamole sitting on the dinner table. And I didn't know what to do. And so I, I just, I just, you know, I waited for about five years. I figured that was a statute of limitation. I waited for about five years before I told her family what had happened. <laughs> anyway, just as, nice. as you're mixing families, as you're mixing traditions, there's always going to be some, uh, some differences that take a little bit of effort to iron out. Definitely. Okay. And the last one, the five minute rule. It, the five minute rule, just an important, uh, one of the things that we've learned is, is that, uh, there's there's a time for bad news, but it's it's not the first. You know, as, as I get home from work, uh, my wife has learned not to to dump up on me about what the kids did or what happened. And uh, as I as as I get home from work, I don't immediately tell her all the bad news of what's happened that day. Uh, yeah. We make sure that there's a couple of minutes of of fun interchange and and that we you know build our relationship and have a good time. And only after we've been home for a, a couple of minutes, then then can we start to vent and, and discuss bad things or who needs a spanking or, or yeah. who got what grade in what class or whatever. Well, here, here, I can vouch for that one for sure. Similar to that, just, uh, you, you know, when there, and, th and this one is less for just a re relationship of two, but with kids in the family, um, you know, when there's several people in a room, just learning to uh, kind of test the temperature of the room before you, when, when you walk in, uh, too often we've had a couple of our kids that just, uh, again, selfishly without thinking would walk into a room, you know, the, the, the example, somebody just died and everybody's talking in hush hush and somebody walks in and says, I just got a new high score on such and such. I mean, you know, just when you do walk into a room, make mm. sure you kind of take a moment to, to feel the ambiance, to, to feel the temperature and, and then before you just burst in and start talking. Again, all, all of these are just good examples of learning how to uh, slow down and see things from other people's perspective and, and not just be so self-centered on, on your own needs or your own world. That's great. Love it. Finally, let's take a moment just to talk about the coronavirus really quick. There was an article in the New York Post the other day that was titled, I don't know if you saw it, Coronavirus is Making Couples Sick, Dash, of Each Other, Lawyers See Divorces Surge. So I know you had some some thoughts about that. Do you anticipate a rise in divorce, of, or how is uh, the coronavirus affecting Sure, absolutely. Couples? Yeah, the... Our phone calls coming in on a daily basis right now are down a little bit just because everybody's staying at home. Uh, so, but but I do expect that as soon as or shortly, I mean the the dam is going to burst. The people are mm -hmm. sitting at home uh, in in a bad relationship, and things are just going to get aggravated. We kind of see the same thing every year. I think this is going to be much bigger, but we see the same thing every year. Nobody wants to file for divorce right between Thanksgiving and Christmas. So every December, our new client intakes in December go down. But then come January, January they, they yeah. spent time with their family. They spent time with their in-laws. There's been alcohol involved. Come January, they're making New Year's resolutions. And all of a sudden, January is our very biggest month. And in fact, December and January combined are usually as big or bigger than, than any other two months of the year. And so we're, we're going to see that same thing here, that people that have been stuck in their house with their spouse, we call it spousalation. Uh, you know, they've been put in the house. They've been in a situation. They're spending a whole lot more time with a spouse that, that they may not even know anymore because they haven't worked on their relationship for a long time. Uh, those people are going to be calling. Now, can this be an opportunity, you know, spending a extra weeks with your spouse, an opportunity for, for growth and communication and to tremendously improve your relationship? Absolutely. For some people, if they're taking care of this time. Uh, but for a lot of people, the extra the extra stress of COVID-19 and being stuck in a spouse, uh, stuck in a house with a spouse, uh, I think it's going to absolutely have attorneys very, very busy for the rest of 2020 cleaning up the mess from from the ice uh, from the. Yeah. Uh, quarantine. Right. Right. So it's sort of a parallel to having been together a lot during the holidays. And that's now it's going to be that way in spades. Sure. Except it's, for yeah, it's, two weeks, it's four or six weeks. Yeah. Or hopefully not longer. Oh, my <laughs> gosh. I don't know what what's going to happen. But at any rate, um, I have to say, I'm, I'm, I'm impressed with how you can manage to do what you do every day and then have this long marriage, five kids, a completely different kind of life than what you're dealing with on a daily basis. I think that's pretty remarkable. I don't know. I mean, it's not like every lawyer has your situation of, you know, that 
you know, a long marriage with a lot of kids. I mean, that's kind of unusual in a way, isn't it? There is a high divorce rate among divorce attorneys. And yeah, yeah I mean, to, to me, I have to, I, I very, I don't, I Wait, don't hold on, back home. up. I didn't know that. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I didn't know that. There's a high divorce rate among divorce attorneys? I, there seems to be. Again, I, I haven't read statistics on this. This is just from, from friends and people your, I know. There, it does seem to be, uh, it's a high stress job and it does seem to carry over uh, if, if people aren't careful. So for me, I, I'm very careful not to work at home. I mean, even with COVID-19, I come, I shut my door now and, and yeah. you know, we're, we're taking precautions and we still stay six feet away from each other. Uh, but but I, I don't like to bring my work into my home um, because... In I, your case, definitely not. <laughs> yeah. I, I, it's just the work I do is very nasty and I, I try yeah. and I leave at home. I you know I have about a 15, 20 minute commute though right now without any rush hour, my commute's about five minutes long. But but I use that time when I'm when I'm coming into work to put my ugly game face on and and yeah. come in and work real hard and then when I go home I use the commute to unwind and try and not be the divorce attorney by the time I get home my kids don't Are like being kid- interrogated my wife doesn't like being yeah. suspected and and uh, you know if I'm too too critical I mean all day long I'm using critical thinking and if I go right. home and take it home it's it's going to be tough so I, I try and be two different people and and it yeah. does take effort to do that me too I know all about that one oh my gosh. Yeah, I mean, there was it before I kind of moved into the podcast and coaching phase, I had, you know, I'm the author of several books, and spent a lot of time debating um, the issues for many years. And so I as like, for a living, like during the day would be in argumentative mode, just as a regular, that's what I do. I can't bring in my debating skills with my husband. <laughs> I come home. That's not what he's interested in. So it took yeah. me a while to learn how to separate those two. So I, I get it. You, you take that home and you're right. But you yeah. know, do you want to be right or do you want to be married? Yeah. I mean, exactly. Back to that. So exactly. Being, being right is all of a sudden less important at home. Are your kids fascinated by what you do? Do they talk? ask you a lot of questions? Um, I wish they'd ask more. And part, I guess part of that's why I'm writing it so that eventually they, they will read my book because I wish they'd listen to more of my advice. But <laughs> what, what they're fascinated at is that they're, they're fascinated that someone like you would want to talk to me. They're fascinated. When I get to be on TV, they're fascinated oh, yeah. that, you know, they, they think I'm such a boring, stiff dad. And, and then when I, when I do get to be interviewed on, uh, you know, on TV or on, on podcasts or whatever else, you know, it, it, it blows their mind that, that I'm more than just, just a lawyer or whatever. That guy, yeah. Just the, yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Very interesting. Okay. Well, um, I appreciate your joining us today, Douglas. It's been great. Now, tell us what you're working on now and uh, where people can find out more about your work. My official, as a lawyer, our website is davismiles.com. Uh, the book is Amazing Intention is up on Amazon. You can search under Douglas Gardner or Amazing Intentions and it'll pop up, should be the top one. Uh, I, right now I'm trying to finish up a book I'm working on called Out Up and Down Back, it, more of a financial book of, of uh, how to, uh, anyway, quick and simple, if, you, if you're doing a hike, I always like to hike up and then I know I can come back down. I, I'm always fearful of doing a Grand Canyon hike because you hike down and, and it's a, all the hard work's at the end, you don't know yeah. if you can get back out. So. By comparison, then, financially, if you do all the hard work when you're younger, and then you get to pay off the rest of your life. I'm working on that. Probably not as exciting for you. But then the, what I'm starting is I'm finishing that book, the, the notes and, and uh, brainstorming that I'm working on. I, my next book, more in lines of, of, of family law and marriage issues, is I am working on a book of forgiveness in marriage that really focuses a lot on um, how – Couples can get over infidelity and, and mm. have their marriage succeed even after infidelity. And one of the things we found is that sometimes, uh, uh, you know, if, if there's a simple one instance infidelity, sometimes that's actually much easier for marriages to get over oh, than sure. the, the death by a thousand cuts oh, yeah. marriage mm-hmm. where there's just, you know, there's just so many small insults in the marriage that it, sometimes those thousand cuts are harder to recover from than the the throat slashing of, of your spouse going mm-hmm. out and having an affair during your marriage. So that's, we're working on that. I mean, it may be towards the end of the year or even longer. I, I, it, it takes a, it's hard to yep. find time to, to get in and write everything. <laughs> I can't imagine when you have a full-time job uh, doing that on the side. So I get it. Well, awesome. It all sounds great. Really appreciate it, Douglas. Thank you so much for coming in. This has been very, very interesting. I think, I think my listeners are going to love it. Good. Pleasure to be here. Stay safe and healthy. You too. Take care. Let's go to the email of the day. This one's from Josephine. She writes, Dear Suzanne, my situation has drastically changed because of COVID-19. My husband has to take 12 weeks unpaid leave due to an underlying health condition. Our three-year-old son's nursery is now closed, so my husband will basically be a stay-at-home dad. I am a key worker, and I'm fortunately able to pick up extra shifts to top up my part-time income. 
I know I will be tired from long work hours and my husband will struggle to keep on top of the housework while caring for our son. How on earth can I make my husband feel like the man of the house during this time? This is interesting because this is such an unprecedented period, obviously. And her question made me think of World War II and that period of time when women were all of a sudden leaving the home and going out into the factories. So there's often going to be times when you have to switch up your roles like that. And I don't think that the doing that for a finite period of time should specifically cause anyone to lose their identity. However, I can understand why she feels that way. And so the most that you can do during that time, if you suspect, I guess, that he's feeling that way is to just simply pump him up, just pump him up. For example, she said she's going to be tired from long work hours. So make sure that if that's the case, which I'm sure it will be, that you don't take it out on him and allow the way that you're feeling physically to hurt what's going on at home because he's going to be struggling with doing something he's not used to doing and being home with with their three-year-old son. So just a lot of, I think what's needed during this time is a lot of grace, a lot of pumping each other up. You know, this goes both ways, but if you're doing something that you're specifically not used to doing, not nitpicking on how that person's doing it. I think that's really the best way of doing that is just thanking the person, being grateful and not nitpicking because it is temporary. If they don't do it as well as you do, who cares, right? This too shall pass. And I don't think it needs to be, you know, this major identity crisis. There's really no reason for it specifically to be. It usually doesn't come into play. That issue doesn't come into play unless it's sort of a permanent or very ongoing long endeavor. So um, I doubt that that will be. So I hope that helps Josephine. Thanks for the question. And that ends this hour of the Suzanne Venker Show. Don't forget to tune in next week when I'm back with Andre Parody, who I know many of you have missed. And if you haven't done so already, don't forget to continue the conversation on Facebook, where we've set up a private group that you can join. Just type in the Suzanne Venker Show in the Facebook search bar and you'll find it. And if you have a question or a comment for me, email me at Suzanne at the Suzanne Venker Show.com. Thanks for listening, everyone. Have a great week.